Welcome to the Atlanta Sci-Fi Film Festival's panel, A Conversation with Panavision. Panavision is a leading provider of cameras, optics, and end-to-end -end creative services for the motion picture industry. Joining me today is Aaron Sappa, who's the manager of the New Filmmakers Program at Panavision. We have Mike Carter, marketing executive at Panavision. And we have Guy McVicker, Panavision Technical Marketing Manager. And we have Christine Carr, who is the Business Development Director with Light Iron, their post-production company. And of course, my name is Amanda Ray, Film Festival Director. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. You're very, very welcome. So um, I, before I jump straight into all these questions, I definitely want to uh, thank you guys for coming on this panel and helping to educate a lot of filmmakers on Panavision and what you guys do, as well as Light Iron. I think a lot of filmmakers are so busy creating films and doing all these other things, maybe they forget, you know, or don't, or, or just not as aware of what you guys do um, because they feel like, you know, it's for bigger filmmakers and not for them. So. I'll kick it off by asking Aaron if you can explain to everyone what the new filmmakers program is at Panavision. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And actually, that's a great lead in to the new filmmaker program. You mentioned that there is a perception uh, we find at times um, with a lot of up and coming filmmakers that perhaps Panavision is a company that they look forward to working with at some point. It's very aspirational. Um, but we don't want you to think of Panavision that way. And the new filmmaker program is. Uh, I like to describe it as the umbrella under which Panavision provides outreach, access, and support to the community of aspiring filmmakers. So um, there are a couple different ways we do that. Uh, we do events like this, obviously. We have a lot of educational presentations uh, in you know, pre-COVID and, and hopefully at some point soon to be post-COVID days. We, we do tours, we do classes, we do demos on site, we do uh, workshops. Uh, and then, of course, kind of the main um, thing that people know about uh, is the New Filmmaker Program grant. Um, and that's actually been around for over 25 years. Um, and wow. basically, that's a, yeah, that's a program where it's a, it's a year-round program. You can apply anytime. And essentially, um, we provide uh, camera systems, Panavision professional camera systems, at little to no cost for schools, for um, you know, workshops, and then, and then definitely and absolutely for independent aspiring filmmakers. So to any of the filmmakers attending, any of the students attending your festival, um, we would love to tell you more about it. Um, if you, any information you want, our door is always open for any of these programs, including the grant, um, and that's just NFP, New Filmmaker Program, NFP at panavision.com. And then a really cool thing to add to the grant is that just recently, I think in June, is when we launched the, uh, the post-production grant. So Christine is going to talk a little bit about Light Iron, um, and they were uh, generous enough to join the program, and so now we also offer a post-production grant as well as the original equipment grant. So the program is still growing, and we're always looking for ways to build bridges and build relationships now with uh, filmmakers on your way up. Um, because, you know, frankly, we don't want you to go out and build a relationship somewhere else. We want that relationship to be with us from the start so that when you have your $200 million movie or series that you're coming to us, you know? <laughs> so that's the new filmmaker program. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know there's going to be a ton of filmmakers who are going to be hitting you guys up now. <laughs> I, hope, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, I just feel like there, you know, a lot of people just are not as well aware of a lot of resources and things like this out here. That's why this is so awesome. It's so great because we do have a lot of filmmakers who are, um, you know, heavy into science fiction or new to even science fiction or any genre that can benefit from this. Um, I know that science fiction is just a genre that it has been a very intimidating one to a lot of filmmakers because they felt like they needed all of this, you know, uh, VFX or all this equipment to do the simplest of things. But, you know, knowing that you guys are there to support uh, young filmmakers, it means a lot. It means a whole lot to a lot of people who have some great stories to tell. So thank you so much for creating this program. Absolutely. So Mike Carter, he, uh, like I said before, is a marketing executive uh, at Panavision. Um, so marketer to marketer, <laughs> what are the trends you've guys seen over the years and, um, uh, and that you're seeing these days and how productions are approaching uh, their equipment choices? Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, there's always new cameras coming out, there's always new lenses coming out. The 
the biggest change I'm noticing at least is it seems like more people are have uh, are in the decision making process when it comes to cameras and lenses. So especially you know sci-fi, your visual effects team might have um, specific camera needs or pixel count needs. Um, your distribution uh, they have a say in things. Um, you know and and oftentimes the director and cinematographer are now collaborating with you know three four other departments to make their their camera choice needs which uh is interesting you know yeah no that definitely is um and but more specifically you know how have the evolving technologies of filmmaking changed uh, changed the way panavision's customers may approach you know filmmaking uh, a lot more testing. <laughs> we, I think we, uh, because of digital, which is so great, you you can now shoot tests. You can go, you know, come into Panavision or you know somewhere, and you can test different lenses. You can you can push the lenses and see how dirty and gritty you can you know is acceptable for the project, or how clean you want it. Um, you can run it all the way through post. Um, you know, it's it's a it's opened the doors. I think the uh, accessibility to a lot more filmmakers, which is exciting. Um, that said, I want to say we we've, we've shot more film this year than we have in in a few years, which is awesome. Um, and same thing with like the new filmmaker Grant. Film cameras are you know as busy as ever and uh and available but also with so many digital choices i think it's pretty exciting um for filmmakers right now to to really have more choices and more access to cameras than ever before which is just gonna uh, make that many more artists um in the future which is awesome Right. Um, do you know have any? Uh, do you have any examples uh, where someone might have, you know, made some interesting choices? <laughs> I know there's a lot of DIY folks out there, people who just kind of like put things together. Um, I know, like in, um, like in Africa, I've seen filmmakers, young folks, just, you know, they create films in ways that we can't even imagine. Like they'll find out, you know, they'll find ways to get things done. Um, because of the resources, they're, you know, they're limited. Um, are there any examples that you know of where people use maybe some unusual choices of how they approach their, their equipment choices? Um, yeah, I mean, well, specifically for sci-fi, I, I, well, first, all lights flare in space. That is just <laughs> an absolute, if you're in space, you're going to have a horizontal flare off of every light, and that's just that's the rules of space. Uh, I think it was Newton, I believe. Um, no, um, sci-fi is so cool because we've had shows come in and absolutely say, "I, I don't want this to look. It's in the future, but the future is this dystopian future. I want the grittiest. You know, let's let's shoot 16 mil with really funky lenses." Um, and we've had shows that want this pristine, you know, for them, futuristic or sci-fi, it's the sharpest of the sharp and the cleanest of the clean and everything's pristine and, and it really, the story determines the look. Um, one thing I've noticed more for, for indies with, um, with like prosthetics and stuff, for a lot of, uh, a lot of sci-fi or like robots that are homemade, which is awesome. Um, those shows have tended to use older, softer lenses to hide a lot of the flaws because they don't have the multi-million dollar budget for, you know, their uh, animatronics or what have you, or for makeup. They're doing it themselves. They, those shows, especially on the indie level, tend to go with older lenses to hide a lot of the details um, where the big blockbusters a lot of times will go with new lenses because Christine and her team want as much information with visual effects and fix it in post, that type of thing. So um, just a trend I've noticed, um, and usually they're calling me and I don't know and I pass them over to Guy McVicker, who's uh, <laughs> the, you know, the lens and technical guru. 
Got it. Got it. Um, you answered some of the some of the questions uh, that I was about to ask yeah. about <laughs> about up and coming, you know, filmmakers who are listening or watching rather. Yeah. Right now, what advice you could give them and <clears throat> putting together some of their you know, productions and getting the most out of their budget. And I think some of the things you mentioned is very important. Um, and like I said, I've seen a lot of young filmmakers kind of DIY it totally to kind of lessen the cost. Um, do you have any examples that you can share of independent films that uh, that did work really well in, in, you know, saving the budget and doing those kind of things? Any others? Um, of course, I'm blanking on films. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, I. I I definitely know filmmakers and tricks that they've used um, as far as, you know, you can take a piece of fishing line and color it blue and hit it with a flashlight and there's your, there's your you know, uh, flare in space, you know, for the, the indies. Um, there's definitely ways to achieve stuff. I've had friends that have gone to Ikea and bought all the bowls and made their own lighting mm -hmm. scenario. You know, LED strips are super cheap. You can production design uh, you can certainly stretch a budget with some creativity and, you know, some arts and crafts um, where, you know, the whole team is working on the look, uh, not just, I guess, the, the production designer, um, but, you know, the cinematographer's working with them to hide the lights and, and the whole thing. So it's do it. And the other, I guess, advice would be um, in the Words of a good friend, Jonathan Lewis, who's a director. He said, ask not, have not. So if you don't reach out and ask us for something, or you don't reach out and call the, the visual effects house and ask, you, you never know. Um, you know, the worst that we could say or anybody else can say is no. I, I think, uh, be bold. That's a good advice. That's de definitely good advice. And I mean, filmmakers know that, you know, uh, take the village. You got to ask around. You got to get help wherever you can get advice wherever you can and get tips wherever you can, whether it's on a YouTube video or reaching out to you guys. Uh, some of the information you just gave, like probably is saving someone right now with a dilemma that they're having and shooting and, and trying to figure out lighting and figuring out how to make it work. So those are all really great you know, tips and advice for a lot of filmmakers out there you know, trying to get their stuff done. So um, Guy, I have some questions. Uh, I think we were talking a little bit earlier uh, that was kind of some of the questions leading a little bit in your area and you're the Canada Business Technical you know, Marketing Manager. So um, for those who don't know, tell the audience what the technical marketing team does at Panavision versus the marketing team that Mike is part of. Uh, so technical marketing um, plays a few roles inside of the company. Um, one is our job is to educate the sales team and our staff on existing Panavision equipment, its functionality and its purpose, as well as with the clients. Um, to source new and exciting technology and to choose to what to choose to pull into the company, what to choose not to, and to train uh, internally and externally on that. Um, we also set all the service procedures for all the equipment that we house. Um, and we also like to work a lot one-on-one -on -one with the filmmakers, so the director, cinematographer, and producers to help them hone their look. So we do a lot of in-person demos with the filmmakers in the facility uh, we shoot a lot of tests, and the goal is to help them create their look by pushing them in the direction of the pieces of equipment, the cameras, the lenses, the accessorization that will help them achieve their look. Awesome. Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to ask about Panavision's lenses in a minute, but Panavision also designs and innovates throughout uh, the filmmaking process, including your DXL2 camera. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, ever since the design and the release of the Panaflex, Panavision has kind of been an industry leader with camera systems. Uh, and even the systems that we don't manufacture in-house, we purchase from the third party and we do what we call as Panavizing them. Uh, and so we come up with our own proprietary accessories, um, many of which are what we call toolless, which allow you to interchange the camera for two, through different handheld Steadicam studio modes without requiring any tools. Uh, and so we still today apply that same principle that was yielded back in the late 50s. Um, and so we're constantly looking for like new equipment ideas that are proprietary as well as purchasing third party items and making them better for the end user. Uh, and then being foremost an optics company, 
we're always trying to be on the edge of optics. Um, so um, we've got 23 proprietary Panavision optics, plus we still carry everything else that everybody else in the world can purchase. Um, and we have a few more proprietary options coming in the near future. Nice, good. Oh, I wish I was a filmmaker right now. <laughs> I don't know, I might get inspired one day. I totally doubt it, but <laughs> I, just, I just think this is so awesome for a lot of filmmakers out there watching this right now. It's really gonna help, uh, I think, a lot of people to understand all of what you guys do. But um, so the pace of uh, technological innovation of, uh, you know, in filmmaking is clearly very different today than it was uh, from most of the history of the film industry. Um, how was Panavision and specifically your R&D changed to keep pace with this new way of working? Um, well, um, I mean, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lot to cover. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we're, I mean, um, so the technical marketing team, the sales team, um, and the engineering team work very closely together. Um, we meet very, very often to talk about this exact thing, like how do we stay on the edge um, and um, we, you know, we've got some new mechanical um, items coming up um, and optical items coming up. Um, and uh, we just, we work specifically with the client to, for this feedback, like what do they want to see? What do you want to see? Um, a lot of our newer innovative ideas before they see light, they, they get to be in the hands of specific clients for feedback. Um, so it's not just our idea specifically, it's also comes heavily, the clients are heavily influential and, and how we navigate through the future. Um, uh, technology, I mean, it's moving really quick now. So um, while Mike mentioned we still rent a lot of film cameras, we're, we're currently trying to upgrade and improve those designs to better suit modern motion picture, um, but at the same time, stay on top of the latest, greatest, smallest, fastest system that just popped up yesterday. So um, hopefully that helps. Yeah, it does. That's a lot to keep up with, though, because there's somebody uh, making something all day, every day, all the time. So that's a lot to, to stay on top of. Um, what do you see on the horizon in terms of you know new technology and filmmaking? I'm pretty sure there's some Georgia Tech kids. We partner with Georgia Tech all, you know, every year, so we know there's somebody right now probably creating something. But how do you see camera systems changing and evolving? Are there any uh, you know like products or innovations coming up uh, from Panavision that you can share with us? Um, I mean, me mechanically, we have a couple of really neat things like in the pipeline right now, um, some of which we will hopefully be able to release by end of year. Um, optically, same thing, um, and we can, we can talk more about that as we get deeper into optics. Um, but um, the trend, like this, these last few years, like large formats dr dramatically captured the filmmaker's eye, uh, and then to top that off, anamorphic large format has even is have an even, even higher draw. Um, so um, that keeps us pretty busy uh, and we're constantly looking every day, um, even with the same optics on the same camera, we're manifesting new looks for, for this cinematographer versus that cinematographer. So existing products, new products are constantly being modified and altered uh, to fit the, the look and desire of the cinematographer. So um, in terms of equipment, um, smaller, lighter, faster, um, you know, um, larger, larger data files, higher resolution, um, faster reading and writing times, you know, faster ISOs, more sensitivity, more latitude, like everyone's trying to like outdo the one that popped up a year ago. Um, so we, we expect to see cameras get smaller, lighter, you know, faster ISOs, more sensitive. Um, we, um, lenses smaller, lighter, closer focus, um, we'll see the, the high-end, high-performance optics, like our Primo 70s, continue to manifest themselves. And then we'll see the lower performance, more higher aesthetic you know, optics, like our anamorphics and our, our new V-series lenses, which are, carry a little more aesthetic and a little more beauty out of the gate. So both, I, we expect to see both from ourselves as well as from you know, the competition and many third-party manufacturers. So it's gonna keep us all very, very busy. Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. For a long time. Yes. And just to clarify, I know, uh, you know, uh, Georgia Tech actually, I always say there's some Georgia Tech kid creating something or MIT kid creating something that we don't know about. 
you know, in this dark business room, but I didn't mean to lose that your second working on anything. <laughs> so anybody out there was like, oh, they're working on stuff? No, <laughs> um, not to my knowledge at all, but I always feel like there's someone always inventing something in their living room that's only a day or two away from becoming patented and, and out there in the world. But uh, it'd be interesting if somebody actually could make a sci-fi film. We've seen sci-fi films that show um, new technology uh, when it comes to cameras, you know, uh, all the time, but not for filmmaking. Uh, in that way we've seen it the narrative is usually um you know a camera is kind of following you around or following other people around we've seen the retinas and someone's eye or some you know we also got we already got the, the google glasses we already see that type of type of, type of technology um, in our sci-fi films but it'd be interesting if someone actually did a story that focused more on you know what the future of cameras look like to be used to do filmmaking and how that may change the, the uh, filmmaking process by having these um, futuristic or these, these high-end cameras. Um, so that's just a little thought that, uh, who knows, maybe there's a film already out there that you guys can tell me about later. But um, switching gears, uh, for all the new technology in filmmaking, the optics inside of the lenses use the same basic technology, I think, as been used for many years. What about uh, modern cinema glasses? Uh, well, let me well let me rephrase. What about uh, modern cinema glass is the same, and what has changed in recent years? If that makes sense. Uh, how much time do you have? That's that's <laughs> so. Uh, in a the nutshell, short I mean, the short version is like you know. Uh, spherical optics, we have spherical and we have anamorphic optics in the motion picture world, in our world. Spherical, the best thing I can do to explain is it's modeled after the human eye, you know. Um, you know spherical lens, just much like we have. Uh, but spherical lenses of yesteryear versus spherical lenses of modern are quite different in design. Um, you know, thorium and lead-based optics was something used back, you know, 30 plus years ago. Uh, and they have, you know, a look and a texture that we're drawn to. Modern optics don't necessarily don't use those because um, to manufacture lenses with that, you create waste, which is harmful to the environment. And most manufacturers don't want to spend the extra money to properly dispose of it. Um, Panavision, however, we're a little different because we don't sell our optics, um, and we continue to repurpose our optics over years and years and years. So in, in the future. No promises, but you may see some true modern lens designs with vintage optical elements in there. Um, something that none of our competitors will probably ever even broach. But uh, like modern spherical optic design has changed dramatically. You know, um, the arrival of aspheric technology hasn't has been around for many decades, but it's kind of the one of the foremost thought processes in most modern optics because one aspheric element can do the job of up to three spherical elements. So it's enabling lenses to be smaller, faster, lower in distortion, less breathing. Um, it's, it's really, it can really do a lot to, to keep things simpler. But aspheric glass is expensive. Um, so and we, that's a whole other like 10 minute conversation. Um, anamorphically, like inside of Panavision, Panavision's worked really hard to maintain Panavision's original patented design. Um, and while each generation has its own signature, they all share the same panamorphic, Panavision anamorphic aesthetic. Um, so it makes it very easy for filmmakers to intercut different generations of anamorphics on their film, um, which many of the filmmakers do. Uh, sometimes aesthetically, they want the, the subtle differences that each set has, but many times, especially for, for um, emerging filmmakers who commonly seeking anamorphic but don't always have the availability to them um, we cobble together the best we can a set of anamorphics which will most likely not all be from the same generation but it's amazing how something from the 60s can intercut with something from 2021 and we work with the cinematographer to help that look seem seamless as they cut from scene to scene to scene so you can we can play on their strengths and their commonalities or we can play on their individualities and help accentuate those so um, and then we have more anamorphic coming so there's, there's a few new generations of anamorphic coming um, like the ultra vista which you know has been used on the mandalorian and dune 
um, which is a new anamorphic design. It's a new squeeze ratio, and there are, you know, there's another new squeeze ratio coming, so that's been used on a few films. So there's, we're continuing to innovate, and our goal too is to make the lenses smaller, faster, closer focus as well, so. Wow, that's a lot, that's some good stuff. And like I said, I, I, can, I can totally see now, I don't know if it's an idea for a film, but I can totally see being able to shoot a film by the, the cameras on your glasses or the cameras, it's, in the, it's not, you're just kind of holding and moving. It's, I don't know, I feel like technology is gonna create a different way of how filmmakers actually shoot films based upon the lenses and the cameras and all that kind of stuff. Which brings me to my next question. Um, you know, do you see any upcoming trends in lens use? Uh, you know, we mentioned about cinematographers moving, um, you know, and using some different lenses and how it's going to kind of help them. But moving into different types of lenses or trying new things, are some of the cin cinematographers doing that at all? Um, I mean, there's there's a few trends we see right now, or, or, or um, common common questions is um, a lot of people, well, many filmmakers are looking for very small, very compact, very fast, close focus optics. Um, uh, and so we have a path or two on that. We have some that fill that void, but we're looking for additional paths to, to go down to provide other options. Um, anamorphic is still the number one thing we're sought after for here. Um, or it's the number one thing that people usually come to Panavision to start with. Um, so we're um, just, continually trying to innovate with that and, and make and can grow our inventory because even though every year we make more anamorphics, the demand grows even more. So um, we're doing our best to keep up with that. Um, we have a lot of, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, up and coming filmmakers and cinematographers. Um, what advice would you give them uh, in determining lens choice? Uh, and in particular, if they don't perhaps have a huge budget, which a lot of them do not, <laughs> how can they get the most bang for their buck in lens choice? Um, I, I would um, persuade them to not be afraid to reach out. Um, you know, um, uh, and myself and the team that I work with and the individuals here, like I, I really, we, I really enjoy working with emerging cinematographers, um, uh, whether it's, um, somebody my age on their first film or it's a student fresh out of film school or still in film school like they're they're very fresh and full of ideas and a lot of the crazy things that we've created came from people's ideas so um, you'd like to think that we lie in bed at night and conjure all this stuff up but but a lot of you it don't? comes from our interactions I mean we, we get lucky you know but a lot of it comes from the person-to-person -person interaction with the filmmaker uh, and it's I really enjoy it, um, and we shoot a lot of tests. Um, and every time we shoot a test, we learn something new, uh, and it's nice to. And it doesn't always need a lot of money to manifest the look you want. Um, it's just having a discussion with us. If they have references, um, even if they have two different references that are polar opposites, and they're like, "I like what this has, and I like what that has, and I don't like what that has," that really helps people like myself walk them through that road into what will create that look regardless of what their budget is. Um, there's always a solution, I guess is the answer. Ask, reach out, don't be afraid, don't be shy. No idea is too crazy, and uh, don't be afraid to ask. Nice, that's so awesome, because now I'm just now thinking that uh, our film submissions should actually increase now. So you guys out there who are sending in films, you got no excuse, you got Panavision to call, so don't be sending no janky stuff, y'all. <laughs> you have help, you have people who can, you know, advise you on the best of everything. So I think that's going to just increase the quality of the films that come in. Because I think, again, a lot of, a lot of, you know, filmmakers may not have known that they have this resource and you guys would be able to kind of reach out and ask questions like that. Um, another big component of filmmaking, of course, is, you know, once they shot the film and they're like, oh, well, you know, they got through that part. The biggest step after that is post-production. <laughs> um, I can't even imagine. I have a few friends who, of course, uh, are filmmakers, and it's very, it's a very daunting area. Um, even doing our own uh, video recordings of our panels and stuff, and, and just thinking about that, just recording is just enough right there. When you talk about post-work. That's where I want to talk a lot about uh, with Christine Carr, who's the business development director at Light Iron. Welcome, Christine. 
Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So lots of uh, post questions for you. The first one is, can you tell the audience a little bit about Light Iron and uh, the services that you guys provide? Yeah, absolutely. So Light Iron is a post-production services company, and that means we are processing, polishing, and then delivering the imagery that has been captured with the cameras. And we have our main hubs in Los Angeles and New York, but we also have dailies offices in places where there is usually like a big tax incentive, like Atlanta. Uh, we also have offices in Albuquerque, New Orleans, and New Orleans. Um, and so the services that we provide include dailies and final finishing services, which is conform and color correction of your camera original highest resolution material and we work with the filmmakers to give it the look that they've been after, and, and then we make the final files that air on either the network, or they show in a theater, or they're on Netflix, or you're watching them on your phone. Nice, you guys get the very last touches on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Put all the, all, the, all the icing, all the, you know, all the frosting, and the, all the like, good stuff. Yeah, it's really the juiciest part, I think. <laughs> Yes, it, yes, it totally is. It's just as, I think it's just as fun as creating the film. And, you know, it's like two different worlds, I guess, in a way. Um, but what point do you typically get involved in, 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 in production, in a, in a production? So yeah, and what you know, advice would you give? Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. And what advice would you give filmmakers in, in properly planning for post-production? Sure. So there's really two points where we usually get involved, and the preferred point <laughs> is in pre-production. So while the cinematographer is testing cameras and testing lenses, um, hopefully we are also talking to production at that point too, because based on those choices of cameras and lenses, but also based on what is your target, where are you delivering to, we wanna be in conversation about what is the data footprint, how much you're recording, what production is gonna need, and like how we can support that. Um, so that's the technical side of how we wanna support in pre-production, but the creative side of how we wanna support in pre-production is also um, further developing the look, the look that they are going for with, the right, with their camera choice and with their lens choice. We wanna have the cinematographer and sometimes the director and sometimes the visual effects supervisor also sitting with one of our colorists, looking at that test footage in a bay, on a beautiful monitor, or in a theater, and looking at their test footage, and then refining a look. And what we do is we set up what we, what's called a LUT, which is short for a lookup table, and that LUT became, becomes part of the dailies process, so that every frame that's being captured on set is being viewed through that LUT, which is the look that the cinematographer and director wanted from, you know, wanted from the first moment, from their first vision of the film. And what's great about that, if you work with us in pre-production and we set up that LUT ahead of time, the very first frame that gets shot on set, how they're looking at it on the monitor, how it's being looked at in dailies, and how it's being looked at in editorial where they're cutting together rough cuts, carries that look all the way through, carries that vision all the way through. And that is so important for filmmakers, especially I think for independent filmmakers, because when it's in the rough cut stage, there are a lot of people looking at that cut. There are a lot of voices that come in and people in that process of the cut, they get very attached to the look that they're seeing. And if you didn't have a custom LUT, if you have like just the, you know, like the regular LUT from the camera, it might not reflect the cinematographer and director's intentions, but people get attached. So what we see later down the line in color correction is the producers will chime in and say, make it look like the dailies. And the cinematographer might say, mm, but I wanted this other look, and it, it can become a struggle. So it's a long way to say, we really prefer to get involved in pre-production. Um, if that's not an option, or, or a lot of times what happens is people will come to us after the fact. They've already shot it, they've already cut it, they're pretty close to their lot cut, then they come to us and they're, they're ready to book their post-production services. So um, at that point, you know, then we, you know, we, just, we work with what we've been given, but we have the, the director and the cinematographer still have their full freedom in the color correction suite 
to set the looks that they want, but there may be other voices that have, you know, have an attachment to the, to the look. Um, and what I would recommend for independent filmmakers who may not have a budget to have like a full dailies processing um, service, sometimes, you know, like they'll just have a DIT on set setting a look. If you can commit to your color correction house or to your post house early, even if you're not doing dailies with them, you can get that time with your final colorist to set your LUT and use that LUT on set, have your DIT use that LUT. So for us, like if somebody comes to me and they're like, I can't afford to do dailies with you, but we definitely wanna do finishing with you, I'll say, I will get them in with a colorist and get them a custom LUT for their shoot. That makes sense. Um, I think uh, it's, it's kind of obvious, some of the things you mentioned, but I think when you're, if you don't have a well thought out plan before you start shooting, um, you'll miss all those important steps, you know, that you're mentioning now. And I think that, um, uh, you know, if they do have it planned out, then they know to go to post production and kind of give you guys information. And, you know, I don't even think they think that far ahead. They just shoot the film and then they come to you afterwards. So, so diving a little bit more in that, given all the advances and color correction and finishing, some filmmakers perhaps, like I said, you know, spend less time and focus on and on the images that they capture, thinking that you guys can fix it or, you know, somebody will fix it and post, they do incredible things. They're like, you know, you're like wizards. So whatever I didn't shoot <laughs> live, you could just throw it in post because I think most people see the bigger films and they do see all this CGI and all this stuff that's done and they think it's all done in post and it can be cleaned up later like you're a magician. But can you, see, can you address some of that and talk about what uh, what can they or can't they you know perhaps uh, fix in post and how they can address that and think about that ahead of time? Sure, it's just a giant topic <laughs> because really the the software that we use for conform and for color correction just gets more and more sophisticated every year and blends more every year with the same tools that are being used in 2D visual effects. So there's a lot of things that we do fix in post that becomes like an ordinary thing, like tape marks, like the actor's marks, the tapes. That's like a easy, you know, that's kind of an easy thing that we do that we clean up. Um, rig removal, um, that's, you know, that's a, very, that's a very common thing that it's just expected. Yes, you will clean that up in post. Um, what gets bigger is when we're reshaping the lighting and also beauty work is a very um, common effect as well. And, but both like when we're playing with the lighting and when we're doing beauty work, like those have such a huge spectrum of what's possible for us to do. Um, and so I, yeah, it's, it's, a little, it's, a little, it's a little hard to be, like, I mean like basically, we can totally reshape the lighting. We can you know, put a shadow here, we can pop the light here, we can, make the highlight cool, we can make it warm, we can, we can make really fine adjustments on one section of my face, we can do my whole face or we can do the whole room. I mean, it's, it's really like a wide tool set and it's how you wanna spend the time and money that you have in color correction. Because color correction at its core is about making shot to shot and scene to scene a seamless experience but also color correction sets the emotional tone of the film. So how much do you wanna spend refining your image and how much do you wanna spend on, the emo on refining the emotional tone of your film and how much do you wanna spend relighting or fixing? Um, it's really, it's a really big question and it'll, it'll depend you know, on how, how much was set up in the pre-production and how much how careful they were on set and how, you know, like, and really like, what are the tool sets they want to really take advantage of in the color room? That makes sense. So how does lie down and technology advances? I know that's where the fastest. Sorry, you dropped out a second there. How did, what did you say? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. How does a uh, light iron stay ahead of the technology advances? I know that's where, you know, it's moving the technology. 
Post-production, yeah, post-production is really all about like staying at the bleeding edge of technology. Um, so we have, you know, like we have color scientists, we have data archivists, we have a whole team of engineers and we have, you know, our, our CTO. We have a lot of people who are always, always have their eye like past the horizon. Like not just what's happening now, but what's happening next and next and next. Um, it's really just part of the post game because because of we're the last stop, but what we're creating ultimately is the file that you're going to see on your TV, on your phone, or in a theater. And that is a technology that is constantly changing, but why, you know, like the, the impetus for that change is multifaceted. It comes from partly the consumer technology industry. If you bought a TV in the last three years, it was probably 4K and HDR compatible. So because of that, the streaming studios all pushed for HDR starting five years ago, and now it's like a mandatory deliverable and has been for years. Even though not everybody has HDR compatible TVs yet, they will, and they're thinking about future proofing. So it's, it's driven by delivery, it's driven by consumer technology, um, and then the other technology in post is where post is merging with production. Um, we talked about the Mandalorian, and the, uh, what they call the volume, which is basically a virtual set. And that is, to me, it's so exciting. It really is the merging of post and production in that moment being captured by the camera. And I just, I find that so exciting. I'm super excited to explore more of that. Yeah, no, it definitely sounds very, very exciting. All the next trends and any other, any other technology, technological advances on the horizon other than what you mentioned? Uh, I think the next technology for production and for post is moving all the storage and a lot of the creative software to the cloud. Um, I think the whole, because of the pan pandemic, pushing everybody to work remotely, um, it, it's cloud-based workflows have taken over the gaming industry or the gaming industry has fully embraced cloud-based workflows. And I think that will be something that's next for post. It's something that we at LightIron are exploring right now. We have a, we have a production that, is, that we've designated as like will be a fully cloud-based workflow from camera capture through dailies, um, editorial accessing through the cloud. And then when we do our final conform, and color correction will be accessing the material from the cloud as well. And I can talk more about that when it's complete. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can. Any other last minute uh, things that you guys want to share with any filmmakers that are watching right now? This is horrible, but it has to be said. Panavision doesn't sell anything. <laughs> so we rent our gear and we'll get it back at the end. Um, but I've done a few panels and then afterwards gotten a bunch of calls of where do I buy it? And unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give us a call, give us your dates, we'll try and rent it to you. Um, but we want it back at the end. Gotcha. <laughs> That's a very important question. Um, I think anyone who may be watching this and new, new into filmmaking may not know that you don't sell cameras. You're not a camera store per se. So that's an important thing. Any other tips that you can uh, share with anyone out there? Other I would, than what you already mentioned. <laughs> I just want to make sure if people didn't tune into the beginning of the panel, the, the, the biggest tip that I can give is just to reach out to us and, and I'm going to give my email again, the NFP, um, New Filmmaker Program, nfp at panavision.com. I just want to say it again because I want to make sure everybody has it. Uh, and, you know, we can start a conversation. You don't have to necessarily get the information right now, but as things occur to you, um, if you have groups, they don't have to be schools specifically, they don't have to be a festival specifically. If you have a group of mm -hmm. like-minded filmmakers and you want to uh, give us a call or give us an email and we can talk about doing um, an educational presentation of some kind or getting together for things, you know, we're happy to explore those things. Um, and, you know, uh, the coolest thing about the new filmmaker program is I get to work with filmmakers who are really passionate, really excited, really enthusiastic, and we take that very seriously here. So. Awesome. Yeah, we noticed oh, I'm that. so glad to hear that. That's amazing. I'll make sure that uh, everyone gets the link. Uh, we'll put the link up on our website and in our socials and all that kind of stuff, just so that people have it. Um, so thank you guys so much for taking out the time to do in this panel. Um, it was very, very important. Uh, hopefully we can do this again and continue to let all the filmmakers out there know that you guys are here. 
to help, um, as well as work with IMAX and some of these big Dune movies and Marvel movies. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome.